Okay, let's continue the morning session. The next speaker is Jaroslav Trinka from the University of California, Davis, and the subject of his talk is amplitude hadron. Okay, uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, organizers, for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful conference. So uh, I uh, will continue the amplitude morning, uh, talk also talking about scattering amplitude, but uh, from a little bit different perspective, also a different object. So this is the work uh, with uh, uh, me, Mark Hamet, and Johannes Hem, and also some more work in progress uh, with uh, the same people and Guy uh, Machicherin, and also separate work with uh, my students and postdoc at UC Davis. Okay, so uh, the outline is that uh, we will be interested in uh, scattering amplitudes in planar n equals four super Young-Nos theory. So we know that this uh, particular theory is a great uh, playground for searching for new theoretical ideas, so we will use it as well. And uh, we will use so-called amplitudehedron formulation for the loop integrand in the perturbation theory. And uh, I will briefly uh, review what it means, but it will be not that important for actually uh, the core of the talk. But uh, what we really want to do is uh, with this uh, reformulation, geometric reformulation of the perturbation theory, we would like to do some all loop order resummation and also answer some questions about the uh, strong coupling physics. Now, uh, we will not work directly with amplitudes because uh, they suffer from uh, some problems such as IR divergencies, but we will define some IR finite quantity, uh, which I label F, uh, G, Z. It will depend on coupling constant G, and Z, which will be one parameter. It will be a cross ratio of some kinematics, and it will be derived from the four point amplitude. And we will find some new expansion, which will be exact in G and also in Z which is natural from the geometric perspective, but so far doesn't have any physical interpretation. Yeah, we will call it loops of loops expansion, and uh, we will be able to calculate some leading order in this expansion and compare to some results actually also calculated from integrability at strong coupling. And we will make some connection to the cusp anomalous dimension as well. So, uh, so our uh, topic is, as I said, planar n equals four super Young-Nos amplitudes, so in planar large and limit of maximally supersymmetric Young-Nos theory in four dimensions. Uh, this theory in planar limit has a lot of symmetries. Uh, it has a conformal symmetry and also dual conformal symmetry. So another set of conformal symmetries which nicely uh, close into the Youngian symmetry. So as a consequence of that, the amplitudes are s very simple or at least simpler than in general gauge theory. And uh, yeah, and for us, it's a great uh, toy model to study S metrics in gauge theories. Uh, the amplitudes are UV finite. Uh, the perturbative expansion is exact in the planar limit. Uh, the non perturbative uh, pieces uh, are absent. And uh, the, the perturbative expansion has a finite radius of convergence. So if we are able to calculate the perturbative amplitudes to all orders, we are getting the exact amplitude in this theory. Apart from the problem with IR divergencies, because of course, if we would like to calculate the actual scattering amplitude, we would have to regulate it. And that would unfortunately break some symmetries. For example, in dimensional regularization, we would break both the conformal and dual conformal symmetries. So that's an open problem if there are some good regulators which would preserve symmetries or what we can do with that. But we will avoid that problem. Yeah, we will avoid that problem by actually dealing with some IR finite quantity. Now let me just quickly review through uh, several different directions in the amplitudes research and uh, we will also use some of these results or some of these methods in, uh, in our work. So the standard perturbative expansion as the usual textbook thing is the loop expansion. Normally, we are taught uh, to uh, draw all Feynman diagrams, evaluate the Feynman diagrams, sum them at a the given order in perturbation theory. There is a more modern version of, uh, of uh, uh, how to do that uh, called generalized unitarity, which is based on the uh, method of first constructing the basis of integrals, so all possible integrals which can at loop level appear uh, in the, in the scattering amplitude with some unfixed coefficients and then fix the coefficients using cuts. 
because on the cuts, the loop amplitudes uh, uh, factorize into three level objects. We can calculate them and then we can fix the coefficient. So we expand the amplitude, any amplitude in any theory, uh, in uh, some basis. And then we have to calculate these integrals. And in general, of course, that's a very difficult problem. And yeah, uh, there, there are many, many people and many different methods uh, to do these calculations. Now, uh, in the planar limit, we are in a better shape. At least uh, we are more interested kind of in the theoretical aspects uh, because we can define uh, global variables. Uh, basically, even in, the, in this expansion using uh, basis integrals, in the planar limit, we are able to label the loop momenta in all integrals in the same way, yeah? to kind of line up the loop momenta uh, in, the, in individual diagrams and sum everything together. So we can really talk about the loop integrand as a single rational function. You can think about it as a sum of Feynman diagrams prior to integration, but there is something unique about it. Yeah? In general theory, if you consider non-planar, you would label each diagram independently. The loop momenta in different diagrams would mean different things, and there is kind of no canonical way how to sum them together. But in the planar limit, thanks to the existence of the global variables called also dual variables, uh, we are able to define this integrand function. And the variables that we will use, I will kind of use both of them during the talk, are either these dual variables, uh, which uh, you can see from the picture. Uh, in the planar limit, the particles are ordered, so the momenta are ordered, so we can just uh, form the closed polygon with the momenta, and at the vertices, you have the location of the dual variables. And the polygon is closed because there is a momentum conservation. And uh, uh, for the loop moment, so these are axes, these are for external momenta, and for the uh, loop momenta, we typically use the, uh, the y variables. These are also points in this dual space. And we can also use different variables, planar variables, which are useful for also uh, uh, different ways, which are called momentum twisters. I will not go into the details, but you can repackage the degrees of freedom. So instead of these points in the dual space, you talk about the points in the momentum twister space, which is just a projective space P3. Okay, and in this momentum twister space, the loop momentum is given by a line. Uh, uh, the, 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 the loop momentum is a given by a line, which I denote as AB. It's an AB line. AB are two points on a line which are arbitrary. In any way, uh, so we have this loop integrand. In planar n equals 4 super young mills, it's a unique rational function that you can construct in different ways. It's a function which satisfies all cuts. It has this dual conformal symmetry, or even Youngian symmetry. And it can be also constructed in dif uh, using different methods, including this generalized unitarity. But we have also recursion relations, which construct this loop integrand from three level amplitudes in the end. OK, so this is just a short comment that uh, in these recursion relations and expanding the integrand, there is a natural basis of on-shell objects called on-shell diagrams. And there is some very nice uh, relation to positive Grassmannian and some objects in uh, algebraic uh, geometry and combinatorics. And uh, importantly, these different pieces kind of in the end glue together uh, in this recursion into a single object called amplitohedron which we will use here in this talk, and I will quickly review just the parts that are needed for, uh, uh, for our work. Now, I would like to also mention that apart from like, this method of constructing the integrand, either as a sum of diagrams or using recursion, and then you have to integrate it, and that's one term in the perturbation theory, and you have to do order by order in perturbation theory. There are also different methods that people developed over the years. One, uh, one particular direction are bootstrap methods uh, in a sense that you still work in a perturbation theory, but you completely skip this uh, step of constructing the integrand, and you directly want to fix the final amplitude. Yeah. For, in order to do it, uh, so you also uh, construct a basis of objects that can happen, but now not integrands or diagrams, but functions. And there is actually kind of a redux of uh, uh, of the function of the information in the functions that can appear, which are complicated transcendental functions called symbol, which tells you about the branch cuts of these transcendental functions. So it's, some, uh, it's a code which uh, has letters called simple letters, and they provide uh, the location 
uh, of the branch cuts of, of the amplitude. So if you have enough control over the analytic structure of the amplitude, you can uh, write an ansatz for this symbol or consequently also for a function and just fix that linear combination and get the amplitude directly without, uh, uh, without uh, going through the integrand uh, process. As I said, the amplitudes are IR, IR divergent, so here what you really calculate in these methods is not the amplitude, but some IR, also some IR finite derivative of the amplitude called ratio function. It's a ratio of two amplitudes or remainder function when you strip some universal IR divergence factor. And uh, uh, finally, we can also use the amplitudes with some uh, loop duality uh, because amplitudes in uh, planar n equals four super young modes are dual uh, to now polygonal Wilson loops. And uh, we can, instead of calculating amplitude, we can also calculate Wilson loops. By the way, this duality also explains the existence of this dual conformal symmetry for amplitudes. It's a conformal symmetry of the Wilson loops. And uh, using ads CFT correspondence, we can get access to the strong coupling, uh, to the strong coupling information about scattering amplitudes, uh, as, uh, uh, as discovered is in a uh, nice paper by Fernando and Juan Mandacena, when they calculated uh, the leading uh, strong coupling behavior of scattering amplitudes as a minimal surface problem in ADS. Then uh, there is also an extremely powerful method you, uh, which uses integrability as an input, the flux tube, uh, flux tube expansion at finite coupling, uh, which uses uh, some building blocks fixed by integrability. And at the, uh, at the amplitude level, it expands the amplitude around the collinear limit, but to, uh, in, it gives an exact expansion in the coupling constant. So, so this is a completely different alternative expansion, which is exact in the coupling, so it's not a perturbative expansion, but expands around some special kinematical point. And yeah, this expansion converges faster than the perturbation theory. So uh, it's an uh, also extremely powerful method how to calculate amplitudes. Okay, but now uh, to the topic of our talk. Uh, as I said, we would like to deal with some IR finite objects. We will do it in the perturbation theory, but then eventually we will be able to do resummation. So we will also uh, have some uh, expression which will be exact in the coupling constant. But uh, in order to define that object, we have to talk a little bit about IR divergencies in the planar n equals four super young mass amplitudes. So first, uh, the dual conformal symmetry is extremely restrictive uh, on the structure of scattering amplitudes. And uh, for four point and five point, uh, the structure of the amplitude is basically fixed to all loops up to a constant factor. There are no non-trivial kinematical functions that we can write. The dual conformal symmetry says that for four and five point, there are no cross ratios that we can write. So everything, uh, everything uh, the structure of the amplitude can be fixed through the BDS ansatz. So if we resum the amplitude to, uh, to the all loops, uh, the, uh, the uh, we, are, we, we get the exponent of the one loop amplitude uh, multiplied by some function of the regulator. So let's say we are doing it in the dimensional regularization. So up to some uh, coefficients in, uh, in the epsilon expansion, which are some numbers, everything is basically fixed. The kinematical part is fixed just from the one loop amplitude. Uh, at higher points, at six point and higher, we can get some non-trivial finite functions of uh, uh, cross ratios, which are not fixed by the dual conformal symmetry. So these are called remainder functions, and we have to calculate them separately. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this object here in the exponent of the amplitude uh, has a one over epsilon square divergence in the dimensional re regularizations coming from just one loop amplitude. And if we take uh, the uh, logarithm of both sides of this equation, uh, we can define an object logarithm for, uh, of the amplitude, and this will indeed have only one over epsilon square leading divergence. So it will be a very mildly divergent object, and the logarithm of the amplitude will be exactly kind of our starting point, what we would like to talk about. Obviously, it has the same information as the amplitude, but the amplitude is, well, is, uh, 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 diverges like one over epsilon to the two L for L loops. It's very 
uh, massively divergent, but all this divergence just comes from the exponentiation. So the real invariant part is just this one law over epsilon square. So we kind of dig down and dig into the real divergent piece, which is a non-trivial information. Now here G on all these formulas is just the usual Toft coupling uh, yeah, given by that. Okay, so now uh, let's look at the logarithm. Uh, we can just take the logarithm of M and expand in coupling, and we can talk about the one-loop logarithm, two-loop logarithm, three-loop logarithm, and so on. And these are just combinations of amplitudes and products of lower-loop amplitudes, but these are very special combinations. If you, for example, look at the three-loop result, this is a combination of three-loop amplitude, two-loop, one-loop, and one-loop cube. Each of the term is one over epsilon to the six divergent. However, this combination is just one over epsilon square. This again just uh, uh, underscores the point that uh, yeah, all the all the these higher divergences are trivial, and only this one over epsilon square is the is really the uh, the, the non-trivial beef in the IR divergence. Now, uh, because these amplitudes are all planar, and I already said that. For planar amplitudes, we can talk about the integrand as a rational function. We can also talk about the integrand for the logarithm. We just combine these things together, and we get one rational function, and that will be in the integrand for the L-loop logarithm. Now, uh, this integrand is not planar anymore because we combined planar things and products of planar things, so it's, it's not planar, but it's uh, some well-defined integrand. And the fact that it only diverges very mildly is hidden in the cut structure. Yeah, so uh, it is actually the, the mild IR divergence <laughs> is a consequence of certain vanishing cuts in the integrand, which are normally responsible for stronger IR divergences. Okay, so we have uh, the integrand for the logarithm, and now we start to integrate. And uh, it's exactly the consequence of these cuts of the integrand for the logarithm of the amplitude, that in order to generate IR divergence, we have to integrate all loops out. So if we integrate one by one, at each step we get an IR finite object, until the last step, when we integrate the last possible loop, we generate the IR divergence, okay? So uh, if we want to define something finite, we can integrate all the way and stop just one, one step before the end. Yes, yeah, yeah, you can prove that, yeah. And so this is closest we can get from the integrands to the amplitude without dealing with the IR issue and with the regularization issue, yeah. So uh, this is the object we will study. It will depend on one loop momenta starting from arbitrary L. We integrate L minus one loop momenta out and just get a function of a single loop momenta. And uh, because of the dual conformal symmetry, this object we didn't have to introduce any regulator, so we didn't break the symmetries, so it's still dual conformal invariant, and that dictates that it only depends on a single cross ratio Z, which in the momentum twister space, you can write it like that, but you can also write it in, a, uh, in the dual space using momenta and so on. Okay, so this was at L loops. It's, an, it's not a rational function anymore, it's a com very complicated transcendental function, but it's finite and depends on, on a single cross ratio. Okay, so now once we have this function, we can just dress it with the coupling constant and sum to all loops. Just like formally define this non-perturbative IR finite object, which depends on G and Z. Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not telling you how to calculate it at the moment, yeah, but I'm defining this object and yeah, it satisfies it's finite and only depends on a single cross ratio. We could also, of course, stop earlier and we could consider other objects, but it would depend on more kinematical variables. Our goal was also to get only a single kinematical variable. Do you, do you know if at a strong coupling that last integral corresponds to integrating on the radial direction? That I don't know. That's a good question. Okay, well, I, I will just on the next slide, this is an exact Wilson loop analog. Yeah, it's the same object uh, which was considered in Wilson loop. Maybe I just uh, showed a slide. So maybe it can be understood in this language, uh, this, because this last point is the Lagrangian insertion of the Wilson loop, and that, yeah, that, that brings the dependence on this last point. Uh, so, uh, so, so let me just say that, and maybe, yeah, um, maybe, maybe we can then uh, uh, talk. 
so uh, the same object appeared much earlier in the literature. So this was nothing new. We just got the same objects from the amplitudes perspective of playing with this logarithm and integrating out things. But this object appeared much earlier as a ratio of Wilson loops, one with the Lagrangian insertions divided by the one without it. So, and exactly because in this combination, the IR divergence, uh, the UV divergences here also cancel. So this is a finite object, and it's the same up to some kind of trivial rescaling of the G. This is unimportant. Here it's written in the dual space, and uh, because of all the machinery, both at weak coupling and strong coupling, uh, for the Wilson loops, this object has been calculated to few orders at low coupling and a leading order at a strong coupling using the same ads cft uh, methods. At, yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, by formal, I just mean that a priori we don't know how to calculate it. Yeah, we define it and then we have to find some way how to calculate it. Yeah, no, no, it's not formal in a sense that there is some problem. Yeah. It's just that I'm not giving you the formula for that. I'm just defining so it. Then we, we basically know that it has a yes, 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 yes. It has. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. So now, uh, as an expansion at weak coupling, it's an expansion in G square, which G, uh, G square is my uh, toft coupling. And at a strong coupling, it's an expansion in 1 over G. Now, as far as, uh, as I know, at strong coupling, only the leading term was calculated. Uh, but maybe, maybe there is also some work on the subleading terms, but I'm not aware. At low coupling, there are several orders because at low coupling, it's just perturbation theory. So you just have to calculate loops, and that was calculated up to certain order, I think three or four loops. But importantly, this is the expansion in G square and one over G. Now, as I said, after we integrate this FGZ uh, over the last loop, we would recover the logarithm of the amplitude and we would get this IR divergence. And we know that the leading IR divergence is controlled by the cusp anomalous dimension. Yeah? So if I write the logarithm of the amplitude, you, uh, the leading divergence is one over epsilon square and uh, it's controlled by the cusp anomalous dimension when this is loop by loop, but of course I can define it as a function of coupling. So now there is a way, obviously, uh, the cusp anomalous dimension is already hidden in the F somehow, because after we integrate F over L, we would recover log, and that has a, uh, uh, that has a gamma cusp as the leading one over epsilon square piece. And uh, yeah, and there are several formulas. We found some new formula in our recent paper, but there are other formulas from before, how to recover the cusp anomalous dimension from F from the function f, and uh, yeah, you can just do it, yeah. Uh, so once you know uh, f, you can calculate gamma cusp from that. Now our goal is to focus on this function f and calculate it uh, for all loops for generic kinematics, okay? So this is basically calculated amplitudes to all loops. Well, this is too hard at the moment, yeah, so we don't know how to quite do it. Uh, but uh, uh, we will do something else. We will use some uh, uh, amplitudehedron picture for loop integrand, which suggests a new type of expansion, not in small g or large g, not in z around some special point, but some other expansion, as I said, which is no physical analog at the moment. But this expansion will be exact in g and z. And uh, yeah, and at the leading order in this expansion, we will go to the strong coupling uh, which is something we always wanted to do, com was completely uh, inaccessible for us. Now, I just want to say that in the simplest case that we will do, this will be very similar to the letter resummation, which was done uh, a long time ago, by just summing letter integrals. Uh, the result we will get will be similar, despite the physics is kind of different. And if you just do this, summing uh, letter integrals, uh, this was done explicitly, and, and then if you go to strong coupling, uh, instead of growing like G at strong coupling, you get exponential suppression. So somehow the letters are not good approximation for a strong coupling physics. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, let me uh, let me maybe go quickly through the geometric part, and then uh, I, I will just focus on the results. So uh, uh, we will use the amplitudehedron picture, which tells you that amplitudes, tree-level amplitudes, and loop integrands in planar n equals four super young mills have some completely different geometric formulation as a differential form on some geometric space called amplitudehedron. 
And in the end, uh, what it boils down is uh, to having a geometry defined by some set of inequalities. They define some uh, region. And you calculate the differential form uh, with uh, uh, some special properties on that region. And that recovers a loop in the ground. OK, that would need, uh, yeah. Uh, th this is just a quick, uh, quick summary of that. And we will use this formulation. And uh, uh, in, the, in the amplitude hedron picture, maybe I'll go back, uh, uh, you uh, talk about a collection of L lines at L loops. So for each loop momentum, there is a line. The line is parameterized by four positive uh, variables. You can think about it as four degrees of freedom in the, uh, in the loop momentum. And uh, there, are some, uh, there are some quadratic conditions on these four positive variables. So for each pair of line, you get a quadratic condition for its parameters. Yeah. So you, in the end, if you want to solve this geometric problem, saying what this region is and what is the form, you have to solve a bunch of quadratic inequalities. In general, like L, L square inequalities, and if L goes to infinity, this is a large system of quadratic inequalities. This is a very complicated problem. OK? But it's a mathematical problem that once you solve, you are able to solve the physics problem of the loop integrand in planar n equals 4 super angles. Now, uh, I will introduce some graphic notation. Uh, so to define the geometry at L loops, for each loop line that I want to impose the conditions on, I use a vertex. I will use a point. And for each condition between two, uh, of these loop lines, I use a dashed uh, blue line. So the L loop integrand is a differential form on a geometry which is, uh, which is specified by this graph. Yeah? This tells that L is 5, you have 5 loops, and the geometry I would like to build says that for each pair of loops I have some condition, I have some quadratic condition. We can have also a simpler geometry like this one when I don't impose all conditions, which is perfectly fine geometry, but it doesn't correspond to an amplitude or to an integrand of the amplitude. Now, the next step is to replace the positive links by negative links. So in the amplitude hedron definition between each pair, I have a positive link which imposes positive condition. But I, so I can also impose negative condition, just flip the sign of the inequality. And this is a complement to saying that there was no condition at all on that thing. OK, anyway, so, so this is just a graphic statement. Using this relation, I can flip all the dashed lines, which are positive inequalities, into the negative inequalities. And I get a sum over all graphs, not just this completely connected graph, but over all graphs with negative, con uh, with, uh, negative links. And then I can write a formal sum over all loops. Again, I dress it with a coupling constant. I sum to all L. And I use some facts between graphs that the sum over all graphs is also equal to the exponent of sum over only connected graphs. OK? This is a true independent of what these graphs mean. But for us, it means that there is some differential form on some geometry. OK, I can take the logarithm of both sides and expand in G. So, so in the end, uh, uh, what we get is an expansion of the logarithm of the amplitude in terms of some new building blocks, which are some d log forms on some geometries. OK? So I just expanded uh, the amplitude in a perturbation theory, the logarithm of the amplitude, in a completely new way. And uh, then uh, now I would like to get this uh, expansion for the function f rather than the logarithm. So I freeze one of the loops. I denote it like that. And I integrate over all other loops. OK, so this was a long way to say that in the end, I get a new expansion for f, which expands it as a, a new type of objects. These objects are IR finite. They originate from these positive geometries, from amplitude hedron and so on. But uh, in practice, they are just some IR finite functions. And uh, yeah, there is some geometry. I, in oh, sorry. I integrate over all the loops except the last one, and uh, the, the, uh, 
we get an IR finite function of a single cross ratio. I'm just saying these objects have no physical interpretation. They are not diagrams, they are not terms in recursion, they are not Wilson loops, anything, yeah? So that, that's the thing. They are kind of purely mathematical objects suggested by this uh, amplitude picture. But let me calculate them. Uh, at tree level, the object is trivial, we just get one. There is no integration to be done, yeah? Uh, at one loop, we have only one object to consider, and it gives this simple thing, and that object directly reconstructs the weak coupling leading order contribution to this F. At two loops, when you integrate over two loops, these black dots are loops you want to integrate over, you can see that we get three contributions. Two of them are very simple. They are just some products of log squares with some pi's. And the last one is a little bit more complicated. There's some Li3, Li4. It's not that bad, but it's a little bit more complicated function. But you can already see some hierarchy here. These two are simple, and the graphs that uh, denote it, labeled that geometry, are tree graphs, yeah? But the last one is a loop graph. Loop not in a sense of the perturbation theory, because these objects are all two loops, but in a sense of like how complicated this geometry is. Yeah, it has kind of an internal loop. Yeah, there is some precise meaning wh why this is more complicated, but just from the visual point of view, it's more complicated graph, and it also has also more complicated expression. Okay, so we have, uh, we saw that there are these different graphs contributing, so let's do our first kind of run through the thing, and let's say I forgot all graphs except the simplest one I can consider, which are ladder-like graphs which are graphs which look like that. I dress them with the appropriate uh, power of the G square, and I sum to all loops. And this is my approximation to the function F. But now, basically throwing out most of the contributions, but keeping just somewhat the simplest one, and let's see if it well uh, approximates uh, the function or not. So, now, the property of the integrand, the explicit formulas uh, for integrands coming from this geometry, allows us to write some differential uh, equation. There is some Laplace operator acting on a graph, so there is some differential equation, is a Louisville type differential equation that we can derive, and we can solve it exactly. So we can actually solve for any values of g and z, uh, this, our geometric approximation of just uh, taking the ladder graphs. Now, at weak coupling, so this is a precise formula that I wrote, uh, satisfying some boundary conditions. At weak coupling, it's obvious that we are taking only a very small subset of graphs, because you should, uh, you should draw all connected uh, graphs, but we are taking only all leather graphs, which is a very small, it's one, one graph per, uh, at each order in perturbation theory. So from this point of view, it's like a, a leather approximation for the amplitudes. And actually, interestingly, at strong coupling, we get exactly the same expansion, uh, we get exactly the same behavior. This thing is exponentially suppressed at strong coupling, unlike the exact results, which grows like G. Yeah, so obviously this approximation gives a wrong, is a wrong approximation at strong coupling, yeah. Okay, but we can do a little more. We can consider all three graphs. Yeah? So the ones which don't have these internal loops, which had these more complicated formulas. And it's, as it turns out, we can still use a similar differential equation. So we again get some Louisville type differential equation. We have to define some generating function, so there is a little bit more work. And we get an explicit solution. Uh, so this is a solution uh, for the tree level approximation in our loop of the loop space of, uh, of this function f where the A coefficient solves this equation. So we cannot write like an analytic expression, but uh, yeah, but it, it is a closed formula. Now, if we expand it at strong coupling, we get uh, this behavior. So it doesn't grow like G. Uh, it misses the leading G contribution. It go grows like constant, or it uh, behaves like constant, but it has a one over G expansion. So it is much, much better than this ladder approximation. Uh, we are still missing the leading behavior, which is not surprising because we are truncating the expansion dramatically, only taking these three level terms and forgetting all the loop terms uh, in this, again, in this new meaning of, of the loop. But now looking at gamma cusp, which is hidden in this F, 
We find this surprising thing. Uh, this is a precise formula for gamma cusp uh, from the integrability. We know the formula for all weak coupling, strong coupling, anything. So we just expand that strong coupling uh, from the formula by, uh, by Zepeden and Schaudacher. And uh, now we also extract the gamma cusp from our tree level approximation. We are, of course, not getting the agreement, but we are getting the right uh, uh, a qualitative behavior at strong coupling. It also grows like G, which is surprising uh, because, again, we took only a very small subset of graphs that we could, and we resum them, and uh, we get uh, uh, qualitatively the right behavior. The, co the coefficient is, of course, different. Yeah, we are not getting the right coefficient, but qualitatively the correct behavior. Now, just a side note, if we now go back to these ladders and we calculate gamma cusp from the formula that we obtained, we get a function which is exactly up to some just rescaling equal to the gamma octagon function studied in a completely different context by different people. We don't know why this is true. Maybe this gamma octagon function is just like a generic mathematical solutions to some problem, but we got the same function. Uh, despite, yeah, it, does, it seems like completely unrelated problems. Okay, so uh, this geometric approach suggests following that we can actually add one more parameter to the problem. We can, instead of fgz function, we should reform it by some new parameter xc uh, that uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's an expansion of these loops of loops in our geometric space. Yeah, so all the three graphs have just g to the, uh, or this xc to the zero, all the one loop graphs have C in the first power, two loop graphs, C square, and so on. The physical case is that we take C as one. All graphs are treated equally. We just sum, should sum over all of them. The thing that we did was an expansion around C is zero, because for us, the loop graphs are too hard. We don't know how to calculate them at the moment. The three graphs are simple. We could calculate them. We could resum them to all loops, the real loops in the loop space. So, so it looks like we are doing this type of expansion. So now the comparison is that the physical case, the thing which has the amplitude in it, or after the integration, we would get this logarithm. Again, we would have to deal with these IR divergences. Is for generic G, Z, and Xe equals one. The perturbation theory is for generic Z, and Xe is one, but expands in the coupling. The, OP expansion, if it was formulated for this object, which I'm sure it can be, or maybe even was formulated, would be for generic coupling, and again, this extra coefficient is kept at the physical value one. But we are doing different thing. We have generic G and Z, but we are taking a small ex uh, expansion around C is zero. But we'll really the physical case is one. So the question is how well, how well uh, we do when expanding around zero to get uh, to uh, reproduce the behavior at one. Okay, uh, I'm at the end. So this was our first attempt to these, uh, use these geometric methods for planar angles for super young mass integrands for resummation and strong coupling. We define this object derived from the logarithm by freezing one loop and uh, not, not getting the IR divergence, uh, keeping everything finite. We have this uh, new expansion in terms of negative geometries and there was some new organization uh, using loops of loops, where these were different loops, not the loops in the perturbation theory, but somehow uh, the, they told us how complicated these geometries are. And uh, we calculated it at the leading order for the three geometries and compared uh, uh, with the exact result. And for gamma cusp, we got uh, uh, surprisingly good uh, behavior. Now, the main question is, can, how can we actually restore this strong coupling behavior uh, in our expansion? Do we have to just consider next order, or is it something which emerges once we do everything at once, once we calculate the exact thing? There are questions about higher loops. We have also some deformed version of these geometries. Uh, hopefully, there is some relation to integrability in them. And uh, uh, also, uh, because now we are able to resum everything to strong coupling, however, our picture is still very weak coupling. We are defining this integrand order by order in perturbation theory, and then we resum uh, these in 
integrated result up to the last integration, but actually the most interesting thing would be to define the geometry directly at the strong coupling, which we of course don't know how to do. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? In the meantime, let me ask, why is the negative geometry more useful than the positive geometry? <clears throat> well, uh, it's just that, uh, well, the positive geometry plays nicely with planarity. So once you construct positive geometry, it's manifestly planar in a sense you can expand it as a sum of planar integrals. The negative geometry plays nicely with IR divergence. So once it's a negative geometry, it is at most one over epsilon square divergent. So f by freezing one of these loops, as I did, you get something finite. So it's not planar in, because it's a combination of, it's a product of amplitudes, a combination of them, which is not a planar object. You cannot expand it as planar diagrams. You can expand it as a product of planar diagrams. But it plays nicely with IR. And also as we saw in the beginning, in order to construct from the amplitude something which has nice IR behavior, in a sense it has very mild divergence, you can have to take these combinations of amplitudes. So, yeah, so it is closely related to that. Yeah, so therefore the negative geometry, yeah, knows about IR, yeah, or wants to con naturally construct a set of objects which have very mild or no divergence. Is, is it um, is it actually obvious that uh, so so you're doing always l minus one uh, loop integrations and then you li li leave one out? Uh, is it obvious that it doesn't depend the result on which ones you you, you leave out? Uh, like in which I order? I mean, ra roughly speaking, whether Fubini, Fubini for these divergent integrals is actually correct? Well, there are okay. So so the integrand is symmetrized in all loops. So therefore, it doesn't matter in which order. Now, also to your question, if it is obvious that it is actually finite, it is, uh, it's a little detailed argument, but if you look at cuts, we know, that, okay, first thing, we know where the IR divergences in loop integrands come from. They come from the collinear regions when the loop momentum is proportional to one of the external momenta. And you can show here that uh, this, uh, the logarithm of the amplitude, the only way how to make loop momenta proportional to external is to do it with all of them at the same time. Yeah, there is a particular cut which takes all loop momenta at once and make them proportional to the external momenta. If you freeze one of them, or one of them doesn't participate in this limit, you can never access the collinear region. Mm. Therefore, it's finite. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah. the yeah. argument about finiteness comes from this. How can you access the collinear region in the loop integration space and without all momenta doing it at once, you cannot do it. So if you freeze one of them, you will never generate a divergence. Mm. And I have another question. Uh, so so, so, so a, as you know, the, the, uh, the actual equation for the cusp is not an equation for the cusp, but for a more general quantity related to spectral para scaled sca spectral parameter. Did you try to find this actual equation as opposed to just the, the cusp? Yeah, well, we were trying here with uh, also Nima and Johannes uh, that there is some natural deformation that you can do on the geometry and like add an extra parameter, which is very suggestive from the geometric point of view. We don't know if it has any physical meaning, uh, but it seems like an extra parameter and it will again work closely with IR divergences. It actually wants to regulate these divergences. If you do this parameter once, you get something which is only one over epsilon divergent. If you deform it once, then for generic value, it's less divergent. If you deform it twice, it seems that it's even finite. So we are wondering if this deformation parameter is related to it, but yeah, but uh, we don't know. Because the spectral parameter also doesn't have a physical interpretation in the gauge right, theory. Right, right. So, yeah, that's okay. possibly, yeah. Since I cannot see more questions, let's thank the speaker again for the... <laughs>
we move on to the next and last speaker of this morning session.